Hi, welcome to Books and Bocadillos. My name is Maria Andrea, and today I have a book haul. I'm doing a book haul. This is the last book haul of 2023 because I am going to be joining the Read What You Own Challenge hosted by Kaminali, uh, Ali at Kaminali, MJ at Reading This Live, Greg at Another Bibliophile Reads, and Crystal at Fiber Artsy. And I, um, I've been doing this kind of like on my own, but then why not join and motivate and each other and be around other people that are, you know, reading what they own and not buying as many books. And yeah, misery does love company. <laughs> so um, I, I have a book haul. So these are books that I've hauled in the month of October. Um, and the Read What You Own Challenge starts November 6th. So um, let's get started. I am drinking a turmeric tea. Um, so the first thing, it's not something I bought, but I received as a gift. Um, so I got this tote as a gift. I love a tote. It actually matches what I'm wearing today. So maybe I'll wear it today. Um, I haven't worn it, still has a tag. But this is um, from outofprintclothing.com. Um, it's like a library card. I like it. I'm excited to use it. And um, most of the stuff that I have, I think is nonfiction. So we'll start with that. And just a plug, I am really excited about nonfiction November. I hope to put up a video soon as like what my TBR is looking like for the nonfiction November. As always on BookTube, there are so many great uh, readathons and buddy reads and challenges happening. It's hard to get into everything, but I like to at least do maybe one of a lot of different things. So we'll see what I end up, but hopefully I'll post more about that. But this is my nonfiction haul. This, these are the books that I've recently received in the nonfiction category. So this one is called Bad Mexicans. It's by Kelly Little Hernandez. And the subheading is Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands. So I live on the border. I live on the South Texas border um, between Texas and Mexico. And um, this is about the area that I live in. This is history from where I live. Um, my family comes from the northern parts of Mexico, so this is what this is very relevant to my family history. Um, it is long listed for the National Book Award for nonfiction for the Kundal. It was also long listed for the Kundal History Prize, and it was one of the New Yorker's Best Books of 2022. I'll read the back. Bad Mexicans tells the dramatic story of the Magonistas, the migrant rebels who sparked the 1910 Mexican Revolution from the United States, led by a brilliant but ill-tempered radical named Ricardo Flores Magón. The Magonistas were a, a motley band of journalists, miners, and migrant workers determined to overthrow Mexico's dictator Porfirio Diaz and oust U.S. imperialists such as Guggenheim and Rockefeller. The rebels had to outrun and outsmart the swarm of U.S. authorities vested in protecting the Diaz regime. Though omitted from the canon of U.S. history, the Magonista story is integral to the modern American life. The campaign to crush the, their insurgency opened a new chapter of policing in the United States. Capturing Magonistas was one of the nascent FBI's first cases. The Magonistas inspired a revolution that gave birth to the Mexican-American population, radically reorienting U.S. culture, politics, and society, taking readers to the front lines of the Magonista uprising and the counterinsurgency campaign that failed to stop them. Kelly Little Hernandez puts the Magonista revolt at the heart of U.S. history. Um... So Bob Ruggiero from the Houston Press says, it's brilliant, Hernandez has done an amazing service to historical narrative at a woefully undertaught subject of the Mexican Revolution. This is never taught in school in the US. Um, I didn't do 
my education in Mexico. So I don't know um, what, you know, history lessons are like in Mexico, but um, I grew up in the United States. And so this was never taught in school. So I'm really excited to read this. Um, and I have been told by my and my uncles that um, one of my great greats was a very well-known revolutionary. So I'm actually really, really interested to dig in and find some genealogy records to see um, to see more about that history. But anything about the revolution really, really interest me because I think that I may be connected to uh, somebody that was a very like well-known, often talked about revolutionary in Mexico. So anyway, got this one. I got this one, Philosophy Through Science Fiction Stories, Exploring the Boundaries of the Possible. This is edited by Helen de Cruz, Johan de Smet, and Eric Schwitz. Schwitzkabel. Um, it says a spellbinding demonstration of fiction's power to shed light on the deepest puzzles of the human experience. This collection is a treasure trove for fans of science fiction, lovers of philosophy, and instructors looking to re enliven their classes with stories that will resonate with their pupils long after the semester is over. So this feels very much like a text, like a philosophical text. And I really love that it has, um, so this book, this copy came from Half Price Books. Um, and it's a collection of short stories or essays, more like essays that are written by, um, well, essays and short stories, written by very fam well-known, famous science fiction um, authors like Ken Liu. I love Ken Liu's um, short story collection, The Paper Menagerie. Um, so he has a story in here titled Excerpt from Thuth, an Oral History of Work in the Age of Machine-Assisted Cognition. Um, Ted Chiang, I like Ted Chiang's work. He has a t uh, an essay in here says, Hell is the Absence of God. Um, so there's some really interesting essays, stories that I'm really looking forward to reading. Um, and I like science fiction. I do uh, enjoy like sci-fi sci stories and um, I like philosophy. I like books that draw on philosophy. An example of a book that m merged those two passions of mine was Becky Chambers, the robot monk and robot series. I love those books. Um, so I think I'm going to really enjoy this collection. It does feel like a text. It feels very academic. Um, it has every like essay has notes, uh, recommended reading, like further reading. It seems like, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Okay, I have this one. The Poetics of Space by Gaston Bacillard. Forward by Mark Z. Danielewski. Introduction by Richard Kearney. So um, this book was recommended um, at on the um, reading, reading the room podcast, um, Jalen at the bar in the bookcase, um, does like this podcast called reading the room and he interviews authors and I love his author interviews are fantastic. Um, he recently interviewed Hillary Lecter who has become like a new favorite author to me this year when I, after I read her book, Temporary. And in the interview that she did with Jalen, she recommended this book. Um, and I was like, yes. I mean, at this point, I will read everything that she writes. Um, my connection to her started because I read that short story, 
that horror, the, the mini, mini horror um, stories that I've mentioned before. I can't remember the title of that horror collection, but Tiny Nightmares, Tiny Nightmares. She has a story in there that's like blew my mind. And then I picked up Temporary and I loved it. And I will read anything she writes or recommends. Um, so the back of this says, the house shelters daydreaming, the house protects the dreamer. The house allows one to dream in peace. Since its initial publication in 1958, the Poetics of Space has been amused to philosophers, architects, writers, psychologists, critics, and readers alike. This lyrical journey takes as its premise the emergence of the poetic image and finds an ideal metaphor in the intimate spaces of our homes, guiding us through a stream of meditations on poetry, art, and the blooming of consciousness itself. Backlard examines the domestic places that shape and hold our dreams and memories, houses and rooms, cellars and attics, drawers, chests and wardrobes, nests and shelves, nooks and corners. No space is too vast or too small to be filled with our thoughts and our reveries. In Backlard's enchanting spaces, we are never real historians, but always near poets, and our emotion is perhaps nothing but an expression of a poetry that was lost. Backlard reminds me of skilled chess players who can take the biggest pieces of with little pawns michael foucault foucault um so yeah i am really curious how this is gonna um pair as i'm like especially like reading this and reading this sounds like a good like combo and then after reading the back of this um that that's a good segue for this other one. So the year of cozy, I picked this up. I got it used um, online. I think better, better, better world books. Um, through the biblio, through the bookshop uh, website, um, their biblio for like used books. The bi biblio link linked me to better world books and um this book i i got while perusing books at the wenda district independent bookstore on bookshop.org so this is written by adriana adarme and it's 125 recipes crafts and other homemade adventures so this is like how to be cozy at home and it has like like, the, you know, the first thing I see is this live, embrace your inner child. So it talks about like how to, how to embrace your inner child at home. Um, make a food inspired flower arrangement. Um, so that's really cool. Breakfast in bed. I'm just looking here, like how to make lip balm. Um, has recipes like how to make coasters, um, drinks, ice cream recipes. It has a lot of different, really, really good things. This is funny. Fancy ass PB and J's sandwiches um so yeah who doesn't like an elevated peanut butter and jelly holiday cookies so the first part of this is the holidays and this is what i think i'm going to focus on um in the month of november and december is going through this and like they have how to make thanksgiving name tags for like a thanksgiving table um no big pumpkin chiffon pie so as I'm like going through this and trying to bring bits of cozy into my home the holidays during the holiday season, I think this is going to fit very nicely with this. And then, of course, the philosophy um, book. So, yeah, the year of cozy. There's things to do year round. So it starts in the holidays like Thanksgiving and then it goes it ends in like um, summer. So yeah, 
This is a cookbook. I talked about this in my recent video where I was perusing cookbooks. I didn't get to really peruse this during that video because I was looking for very specific recipes um, for Day of the Dead. But this book um, I recently received. And while I was uploading that other video, I started perusing this one and found some really, really good recipes to try. So um, this is the subheading says, turn the 30 most commonly wasted foods into 135 delicious plant-based meals. Simple everyday recipes from what's left in your fridge. So this book is to bring awareness about food waste and um, how to use food scraps or things that you would consider food scraps to make delicious meals. Um, it's written by Max Lamana, and I'll show you some of the recipes that stood out. So this one, it, I highlighted this one because I thought this might be a good Thanksgiving side dish. Roasted, roasted sweet potatoes with creamy and zesty tahini peanut butter. I love tahini and I love peanut butter. So it says this goes very well with as a side dish or with a big salad. I think this might be good for my Thanksgiving spread. Um, so I have that. And I'm looking to see sometimes it has little notes here that help to bring some awareness. Um, then there's, let me see, this one. I realized after I finished and I saw this recipe and I was like, oh, for the Day of the Dead, my dad really loved to make burgers. And I thought maybe I could make these burgers from this recipe. Um, meaty mushroom burgers. It says these burgers are for the bros in your life. Already chunky and meaty from the ground meat. meat. I've made them next level juicy and satisfying with extra mushrooms, perfect for barbecues, picnics, relaxed summertime vibes. Pile these high with toppings and make them your own. Beer keg optional. Um, so the ingredients are flaxseed, chia seeds, portobello mushrooms, olive oil, onion, garlic, plant-based ground meat, nutritional yeast, breadcrumbs, smoked gouda, salt and black pepper. And whenever it calls for like breadcrumbs or things like that, it always does use whatever like almost stale bread, like, or the, like the, the ends of the bread that, you know, maybe you don't use in a sandwich, like don't throw that away, use those things as breadcrumbs. Um, so that's one that I highlighted. Okay. Oh yeah, this one too. Extra country onion rings. I thought that would pair well with the burgers. Um, and it's made in the air fryer. This is one that I thought would be really cool to try. It's pesto sauce. I love pesto. And this is an example of one that's like using like scraps. It asks you to use uh, make the pesto with, so let me just read it. <laughs> a high percentage of our food waste comes from the trimmings of veg and herbs, but there's so much flavor and goodness in those odds and ends. I've used broccoli stems here, but any green stalks, even those tough kale ribs would work. Throw them all into this incredible vibrant pesto and spread it in a sandwich, toss it into potato salads or any type of pasta or use it instead of tomato puree in my best roasted potatoes on page 33. Um, so it asks for like broccoli stems, garlic cloves, pasta, um, mixed greens and soft herbs, sunflower and pumpkin seeds, nutritional yeast, Parmesan, lemon, olive oil, and butter, and just leftover spinach, Carrot tops or celery leaves can all be included in place of herbs. So this is one that I thought like, oh yeah, like 
you know, sometimes I'm using cilantro and I have all the cilantro stems and I don't know what to do with it, but I don't want to throw, like, I don't want to throw it away. So maybe it would work well in this. And yeah, I just want to show you just a few of the recipes that stood out that I could put to use soon. Um, this is another like mac and cheese, but it's mac and peas. And it looks really good. Um, and again, it just asks that you use like the breadcrumbs, just the stale bread and things like that. So I found this recipe and I'm probably gonna make this this week. It's my husband's birthday. He loves a carrot cake. So this is carrot pecan cake and orange drizzle. So yeah, it's You Can Cook This by Max Lamana. It's my newest cookbook. Okay, so that is all the nonfiction. I know I don't know about the philosophy. I'm not sure if it's going to be like fiction or nonfiction, but I kind of got a sense of it was more of a text. So put it in the nonfiction. I'll report back when I start reading the stories or the essays. So for fiction, um, I went to a books and brews event um, at the beginning of October that my friend who owns an independent bookstore hosted in um kind of like as a charity or like charity event or like fundraiser but it was like a book drive for a local children's hospital and so she was selling books and it was kind of like you could buy books and with the purchase of a book you give a book and you could also purchase additional books to donate to the children's hospital so um i participated and i bought some books for the children's hospital, but I also bought some stuff um, for me that then it gets kind of matched and um, gets donated. So this one, Sylvia Plath, Mary Ventura and the Ninth Kingdom, a story, it's a sh short story by Sylvia Plath. I love Sylvia Plath. I loved reading her in high school. I haven't read anything since I read The Bell Jar when I was in 11th grade in high school. Um, but I saw it and I thought, I love her. I love her writing. I, I want to read this. <sighs> I don't think I'm ever going to stop, like, just giving Mia Pimananzala Mia all my love for this series. Mia Pimananzala wrote the Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery series. This is book four. So this book came out in September and I thought I had pre-ordered it and I never received it. And I went to go check and I never actually like pre-ordered it. I just thought I had intended to, but I didn't. So I ordered it and it's here and it's the fourth book in the Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery series. This is the fourth book. I don't want to read the back because I don't want any spoilers. I'm still reading book three, um, but it's about Lila and her family, her tia, uh, tia, her aunt, Tita. Tita Rosie owns a Filipino family restaurant and um, it's like a cozy mystery. So Lila becomes a, a sleuth and she's sleuthing, trying to figure out what's going on with these murders that are happening. And it is so well-written. Um, I love the elements of family and friendship and love. Um, her little dog is the cutest. Um, and the recipes in the back. Every book has had recipes. I don't know if this one does. This one doesn't have any recipes. Oh, bummer. Oh, yeah, it does. It does. Yes, it does. Right here. Recipes. So the recipes all kind of usually in every book, um, they're featured in the story. So then she provides the recipes in the back. Um, and they're really good. So, yeah, I highly recommend um, her, the author, and this series. And I hope she writes many, many more books. Um, anything that she writes, I will read. So this is Murder and Maimon. Um, okay. This one, um, Multiple Choice by Alejandro Zambra. 
This is also a recommendation from Hillary Lecter. But this recommendation from Hillary Lecter, I read about in an article online. I was looking up, was looking at articles online, and there was one article that featured Hillary Lecter, and she was talking about books, and she recommended this book, and I looked it up, and I, like I said, anything that she writes or recommends, I'm keen to read. So this is kind of a strange book. Uh, it's a dazzling, a work of parody, but also poetry, author of Chilean Point, translated by Megan McDowell. It's a book about love, loss, guilt, empathy, inequality, and under and life under Chile's dictatorship. It's beautiful, fascinating, brilliant, brutal, all of the above, NPR. Chilean writer Alejandro Zambra is celebrated around the world for his strikingly original, very funny, slightly moving fiction and multiple choice. He invites a reader to respond to virtuistic language exercises and short narrative passages through a series of by turns, thought provoking, absurd and unanswerable multiple choice questions, poignant and political, multiple choices about love and family, authoritarianism and its legacies legacies and the way in which rather than learning to think for ourselves, we are trained to obey and repeat. Serious in its ambition and playful in its execution, it confirms Alejandro Sambra as one of the most important writers working in any language. So it is a multiple choice. It's like taking a test. So for example, like it, it's like excluded term, sentence order, sentence completion, sentence elimination, and reading comprehension. So it's like a reading test. And so you start part one, excluded term. And then it says, in excluded term, in exercises one through 24, mark the answer that corresponds to the word whose meaning has no relation to either the heading or the other words listed. So it'll give you like multiple, A, manifold, B, numerous, C, untold, D, five, E, two. And so you go through and you, it's kind of like taking, so the story unfolds through a test that you're taking. I don't know, this feels like choose your own adventure a bit. I don't know, everybody's answers will lead some to a different story, I think. We'll see, I'm excited. Um, and then I ordered this from the Reparations Club bookstore. I'm a patron of the Stacks and they're reading Tar Baby by Toni Morrison. And uh, it was available at the Reparations Club. And I went to go look at the, the bookstore, the independent bookstore. It's a black owned independent bookstore and I wanted to support it. And they had this featured and I ordered it. It's a darker shade of horror and it's new stories of body horror by women writers. Um, it is edited by Joyce Carol Oates and it features work by Margaret Adwood Tananarive Tanan Dew, Amy Bender, Megan Abbott, Cassandra Call, Raven Leilani, and others. Um, the back says, should we know nothing of the female monsters of antiquity? Still, we would know that the body horror in its myriad manifestations speaks most powerfully to women and girls. To be female is to inhabit a body that is by nature vulnerable to forcible inv invasion, susceptible to impregnation and repeated pregnancies, condemned to suffer childbirth, often in the past, early deaths in childbirth and in the aftermath of childbirth. Um, it talked about, while the common belief is that body horror as a subgenre of horror fiction dates back to the 1970s, Joyce Carol Oates suggests that the Medusa, the snake-haired Gorgon in Greek mythology is a quintessential emblem of body horror in a darker shade of noir, new stories of body horror by women writers, Oates has assembled a spectacular cast to explore this subgenre, focusing on distortions of the human body in the most fascinating ways. So I'm really excited. And my time is up, but lastly, purchased at that event, the books and brews, I bought this one, Abuelita Fue al Mercado for my my, my mom and my nephew and some bookmark pens and some bookmarks. I love Alice in Wonderland. So that's it. I'm really excited um, to share this last book call of the year and happy reading. Hasta la próxima.